Good? Food was good? Yeah. Event is great so far? Awesome. Perfect. Awesome. Um, hi, I'm Niels. I'm Thomas. And we present how to extend WooCommerce blocks. Um, we put up that slide. Did all of you follow these instructions already? Do you have your setups done? Are you still working on it? Okay, then, then I would say we give it another five minutes yeah. or so. Um, it's important that you go through these steps. Um, we need to install the, the NPM package, um, NPM, NPX WordPress create block, which technically is some kind of boilerplate. Um, Thomas and me, we created that package and it pulls it down. It has all the workshop files. Um, and then we're gonna go through all the different steps. But that is, if you would do that one, then we can start jumping right in. Then I would say, let's give it another five minutes or so. Perfect. So, hi everyone. Um, yeah, Neil's already introduced us. We're going to go over the quick agenda. So, we'll introduce ourselves, talk about the motivation for this workshop, give a brief outline of what we're going to cover during it, and at the end there will be time for questions and answers. But if anyone does have a question during anything, feel free to just raise your hand at, at any point. Uh, so, to kick off, this is me. I'm Thomas. Uh, I think about site. I think about code while I'm cycling through Merseyside. I'm a JS engineer at WooCommerce. I work on the cart and checkout blocks. I'm from England. My side business is coffee roasting. So if there's any coffee fans, feel free to come to speak to me at the end. Um, <laughs> and uh, I like cats more than dogs. So hopefully the same enthusiasm from other people comes for that. Uh, I can actually fly light aircraft. That's me in an aeroplane. Um, someone said it looks like a car, but I assure you it is a plane. And I'm a football and baseball fan. Hi, and I'm Niels, uh, also JavaScript engineer together with Robert at uh, WooCommerce, uh, Team Rubik. We create WooCommerce blocks, maintain them. Um, I fight bugs between palm trees and rice fields. Uh, I, live in, I lived in Bali, now I live in Jakarta, Indonesia with my wonderful wife. I'm originally from Germany, so I spent the summer usually in Europe and the winter more in where it's warm in Indonesia. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I live partially in Europe, mainly in Asia. I develop plugins for fun, so um, when I'm bored, I just develop a plugin and I release it on WordPress.org. I love solving Rubik's Cubes. The bigger, the better. The biggest I have is 16 by 16 by 16, which takes roughly nine hours to solve. So it's a perfect one for long haul flights. Um, and I love knot tying. I'm a passionate sailor, and I probably know around 50 nuts. So if you have questions about nuts, come talk to me. And great to have you here at the workshop. So can't wait to get our online orders, but sometimes they come when we're not at home. So what happens then? Um, well, we can leave some instructions for the courier, what to do if we're not in. So when they arrive, they can know where to leave the package, what to do with it, maybe come back another day. And can you quickly go back to the slide? Oh, yeah. So what you see here is if you use the checkout block, the checkout block has different sections. It has the uh, shipping address, the billing address, um, the shipping methods. So here you can actually see the shipping options. We created two default shipping options, free shipping and next day. And what we're going to do in this workshop now is the third part. I'm not at home, please. And then you have that drop-down box, and you can select, leave it with the neighbor, um, place it in the shack, try to deliver it later. So, so this is technically the part that we focus in this workshop now. Yep. Cool. So quick outline of the project and the workshop. So we'll start off by what are WooCommerce blocks. So Nails, would you like to give a quick explanation of what are WooCommerce blocks? Yeah, so you all know Gutenberg and Gutenberg has blocks. WooCommerce blocks kind of has the same mission. What we do with WooCommerce blocks is we convert all the traditional short codes to blocks. We have a card block, we have a checkout block, we have a product filter block, product search block. So technically we create everything that currently exists as a short code and convert it over into a block that it's, that it's seamlessly integrated into the Gutenberg ecospace. So what is a WooCommerce Blocks extension? So as we saw in the image earlier with the, uh, if I'm not at home, it's basically it's a plugin and it adds 
the stuff to WooCommerce blocks. So in that case, that adds an inner block to uh, a block area. Uh, you can extend WooCommerce blocks in lots of ways. I'm just going to show you one of them today. There are many other different things you can do. And the main concept we're going to cover today, so people might not be familiar with these, uh, which is okay. So when we go through these slides, some of the stuff you might think, I don't know what that is. Don't worry, because in the workshop we will cover it. So if it's confusing now, just hold on till we get to it in the workshop and it should hopefully make sense. So the first thing is the data store, which is actually part of Gutenberg. It's called WordPress data. It's kind of, it's built on Redux. It's a way of storing data on the client side. Um, integration interface is a class in WooCommerce blocks and that is a way to tell WooCommerce blocks what your extension is doing. So you can use the integration interface to register your scripts. You can extend the API to add fields, add data from API requests and stuff. It's just the interface between blocks and something else. And store API is a REST API in WooCommerce blocks. It is the way we interact with the server side. So the blocks interact with the server side through the API, which we call store API. And the main files involved today, I'm going to go real quick through, um, they're just pretty standard block files. If you've made Gutenberg blocks before, you should be familiar with a lot of these. Block.js is the main bulk of what we're building. Block.json defines the metadata, configuration settings and stuff. Edit.js is what's going to appear in the editor. If you open the checkout block in the editor, the edit.js file is what's going to render there. Uh, Frontend.js is a file specific to WooCommerce blocks. So actually, what that does is it replaces a static block on the front end with a interactive React component. So instead of just rendering HTML, it's going to mount a React component there. Uh, Index.js is where we register the block type. Options.js, if you have a look at that, it's going to have uh, an object full of options, which will appear in the drop-down menu later. And then two PHP files. One is for integrating with WooCommerce blocks, and one is for dealing with store API. We just separated them out so it's easier to reason with. And when it comes to validation, so because we're using a form on the checkout, we need to make sure it's valid. We have the information we expect. We have three functions. They're from the data store. Set validation errors is how you add validation errors. Get validation error will retrieve that. And clear validation error will remove them when your form is valid. Extending store API, we have set extension data. That is how your front-end code can let the, the request that's about to happen know what data to send. Register endpoint data lets the back-end know what to expect. And extend checkout schema, uh, sorry, register endpoint data is what we use to tell the store API what data to expect. And extend checkout schema is a function in our project where we actually do that work. Uh, so, the picture we saw earlier with the drop-down menu, we want to save this information in a few different places. We want it in the checkout block when the shopper is shopping. We want to keep a record of it when they see the confirmation page to know, oh yeah, they definitely got my shipping instructions. We want it in the confirmation email to reassure the shopper it's going to be handled and for the merchant as well so they know and we'll keep a log of it in the order page in the back end. And can you oh, quickly go yeah, back? And, and what we cover in this workshop is um, we show you how to add the extension to the uh, checkout block itself, and we also cover the order page for the merchant in WP Admin. So we won't cover order confirmation page for the shopper. Do we? Don't we? No, we don't. Not now. No, we don't. That uh, is and, and not the order confirmation um, email for the merchant and the shopper. But the workshop is structured in a way that we kind of have these gold bags. So those are extra steps that you can do. And they're a little bit more advanced, a little bit more tricky. But we also have a spoiler folder where you can actually find the code snippets. We also have the starter repo that you've all checked out. We also have the final version. We will not reveal the link yet. But after the workshop, you get the final version. So if someone struggles, you see 
the final outcome. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, all the code that you see is GPL. You know what that means. Grab it, fork it, sell it. It's your code. You can do whatever what you want to do with it. It's GPL. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, yeah, we'll just jump right into the workshop. Like I said, any questions, anyone struggles, let us know. We can come around and help. Um, so, is everyone okay with the, the steps we had on at the start? Did everyone get them completed and is ready to ready to go? Any, anyone struggling? No? Oh, cool. So, then we start with the workshop. Um, Thomas shows the steps on the computer and I gonna walk around if anyone struggles, has a problem, um, lift your hand. I'm here to assist you to unblock you. Yeah, so um, if everyone has a WooCommerce store set up, we can start by adding a product to the cart. We have a question at the back. Who does, sorry? Do you want me to open the slide again real quick? The, you got it, you got it? Okay. Feel free to take a photo of this if you, if you need. All good? Yeah, all right, cool. So, yeah, let's start by adding a product into our cart. And we will go to the checkout block. And we should see, if we scroll down to the shipping options, we should see our check bo our uh, select box where we can add, well, where we can select an option, but there is actually only one. Um, so let's jump in to our code. We should have the source folder, the JS folder, and inside that is the shipping workshop block folder. And I will just quickly run through the files. We did speak about them briefly in the slides, but I just want to point out two things in this file. Is it big enough for everyone? Is, you want to go a bit bigger? I can. Is that good? Yeah. This um, parent attribute is quite important because when we render a block in the checkout block, this parent block describes where it will be. So if you notice here, we have WooCommerce checkout shipping methods block. And because of that, that's how it knows to render in this section. So if we change this to something else, it would render somewhere else. And underneath, we have attributes. Uh, and the important one is lock. The default value of this is an object with remove true <coughs> and move true. What that does is it stops the merchant from removing that block from the checkout block. So what, if they install this plugin, the block is there. They don't have to add it. It gets added automatically by some function on our end. If we see a locked block, it gets forcibly inserted. You can't remove it, you can't move it. Um, so that's just to remove a step for the merchant. They don't have to do extra work. Um, we, yeah, edit.js, everyone should be pretty familiar with this, I think. It's just a, an editor file that's going to show up in the editor. If you want to add specific settings here for the, the block, you can add them here. In this workshop, we're not going to cover that, but this is the file where you do that. And frontend.js, this is the magic function I mentioned earlier, which will replace a static block with a React component. Um, sorry, is there a question? And just one quest, uh, one, one, one comment also worth mentioning is when you go to the block JSON, you actually see that parent element here. And that one tells exactly where that block appears. Um, yeah, we so did that. Didn't you did that? Yeah, we did that. You also changed it? No, I didn't change it, but no. you were busy. <laughs> okay, sorry, I was busy. He was busy, okay. yeah, yeah, he was. Um, all right, so, does everyone have this in their checkout block? They can see it, great. So, we wanna add some different options to this. We can open options.js, and 
if you notice here, we have a notepad. And that means there's a task for you to complete in the workshop. So there's a hint above, which is try again another day. If you want to add your own options, you can add a couple. So if everyone wants to try that first, they can you know, spend a couple of minutes, just add a few options, uh, reload the page, and they should appear here. So I'll give everyone maybe two, three minutes to try this. Um, any questions, anyone needs help, let me know. After that time, I'll come up and I will, I will add my own, and then we can move on to the next step. So I'll uh, give you a little bit of time.
Did everyone get a chance to try adding some options? Does anyone need help? In Red Chat, do you need help? No, good. Cool, so yeah, I'll just quickly add some of mine and then we can move on to the next step. So we added ones with a label and then if you didn't do it this way, it's fine, but this uh, underscore underscore is a internationalization function. So if it, if it comes to internationalizing your plugin, this will help it be picked up. Um, if you didn't do it, it's okay. So once we've added options and we reload the page, they should appear in the drop-down menu. Um, however, what if our customer, if these options aren't descriptive enough or they want to specify something else, we should let them have some free text to tell us what to do. So what we can do, I actually, um, I already added the logic for this, but if we add an option called other, when we switch to that, it's going to display a checkbox. So if everyone can take a second to just add one called other, and the value needs to just be a string, other, exactly like that. And uh, once that's in place, if you reload your page and switch to other, you should get a nice checkbox. So, uh, sorry, a text box, a checkbox. So once that's there, um, we can move on to the next step of the workshop. Um, give everyone a couple of seconds to do that. On, uh, on what, sorry? If you want to add this input mm -hmm. on uh, some custom label that you created other than product. Yeah, you can do that. So if you open block.js, there is some code at the bottom where it basically says, if the value is other, then show the text area control. So you can change this if you like. Um, Again, okay. it's not really, we, we just did this because adding inputs on certain criteria is kind of React knowledge. We don't really want to go over repeating that, so we coded the bits that we thought were not super relevant to the workshop. But, I mean, feel free to play around with yeah. stuff, absolutely. Um, and then, I mean, after it, you can, you can play with this all you like. Uh, so, uh, yeah, everyone had a chance to do that? We good to move on? Yeah, cool. So when they choose other, um, well, if they choose any value, we need to keep track of it. So earlier in the slides, we mentioned store API. And the way the checkout works is it's not just a form that we submit to an endpoint. Actually, the values that we've added in here, the block sends an API request, an AJAX request to the server. So we have to explicitly add values that we want to send to the API. So if we try to submit this now with this value, it wouldn't be sent to the server because we haven't told it that we want to send this extra data. So if people have um, Redux dev tools installed, uh, it was mentioned in the prerequisites, so it, hopefully everyone had a chance. If not, you can grab it. You can just Google uh, Redux dev tools. Um, and it comes up. There's a Chrome version and a Firefox version below. 
So if, if you need to grab it, it's super quick. Um, but I just wanted to show off a something in the store. So this is a representation of a WordPress data store, which I mentioned earlier. And it just stores some data on the client side. At the bottom here is something called extension data. At the moment, it's empty. So extension data is where we are going to add our custom information. So if we go back to our code in block.js, which is where the main the main field is. Thomas, can, yep. you, can you quickly go back to the, to the browser? Oh. Yeah. Um, there's something a little bit tricky worth mentioning. Can you open this page in the editor while keeping this page open here at the same time? Yep. Fantastic. And now can you go to Redux again uh -huh. yeah. and search yep. for yep. the store? Yeah, there's two. So now you have two checkouts. Super confusing, what happened? Why are there two data stores? Well, one is the front end, one is the editor. If you have multiple tabs open, you see multiple data stores. So that's good to keep in mind when you develop, just close all the tabs, keep one tab open, and you only see one data store. Mm -hmm. It's really tricky, uh, but we often debug, well, I debug for hours in the wrong data store. <laughs> so closing tabs <laughs> is always a good idea. Oh, thanks, Niels. Yeah, so like Neil says, if you have the editor open, it might be a good idea just to close it for now um, to make sure that we only have the, the one data store. Um, yeah, so extension data, let's try and add something to that. So if we open block.js, there is a use effect on line 61, and there is a task in here that explains how to use set extension data to add some values there. So if you want to take some time to follow the instructions here, uh, reload the page after each change, and when you change value, if you open this checkout data store in Redux DevTools, you should actually see the value update while you do that. So yeah, I'll give everyone a few minutes to try that. Um, again, any questions, let me know. I'll just walk around and help people. So.
can also use console logs to set it if it runs. Did anyone, everyone get a chance to do this and check it was working? Did you see it in Redux DevTools? Yeah? All good? So, yeah, this task hopefully was, uh, was easy to follow. Um, the set extension data function is provided to every inner block that you register with uh, WooCommerce blocks. So it actually comes uh, from the props. Um, we pass checkout extension data, which contains the set extension data function. Um, so using that, we can use set extension data to update the, oh well, we actually have the API here, so let's copy that. The namespace I mentioned here is Shipping Workshop. The key is alternate shipping instruction. And the value is selected alternate shipping instruction, which is uh, coming from the select box. If you see the value here is, is uh, it's a React use, use state. So we'll format that, reload the page. We see our extension data is here. It says try again, we change, and it updates. So did everyone get that working? Yeah, cool. Um, but also, if you do other, and we change this value, it doesn't update. So underneath what we just did, is another use effect which fires when you update the text box. So you want to basically do the same here, just update a different key. And that is mentioned, the key is mentioned in the instructions. So um, just to note as well, in these, there's a couple of extra comments. So if you do the code between the comments, that's a, a good place to do it. Um, the extra credit ones with the gold bag, we're actually not gonna cover them in the workshop due to time, but feel free at the end to, well, feel free to try, but I'm not gonna go over them. Um, you can try at the end uh, if you like. So give people a couple of minutes to try doing that. Make sure it works in DevTools. So we should have two keys. We want the alternate shipping instruction and the other shipping value. So we should see them update at the in the in the store they should both be there and yeah don't move on to this next code this next task just yet because we're going to get to that in a minute
All right, so hope everyone had a chance to do that, had a couple of uh, people to help. Um, so yeah, it looks pretty similar to what we did earlier, except the only thing that has changed is the value we're using and the key that we're updating. So this is other shipping value. Um, just to mention, with Redux DevTools, you should be looking at the state because that is representing what is stored. Uh, a couple of people had actions selected here and it was a little confusing because it looks very similar, but an action is just like telling the state what you want to do. So state is currently what's represented, so be sure that you're on this tab. Um, so if I reload here and type in other, throw it to the dog, we should see our two keys in the data store. So we have other and throw it to the dog. Someone raised a good point. If we change back from other to try again another day, we probably should clear the other shipping value. So what you can do is Again, we can copy this. And because this use effect only runs when the text box changes, if we do it in the use effect for the select box, we can uh, just set that to an empty string. Oops, my bad. Uh, no, sorry, we want to do that if. <laughs> That's just going to remove other completely. If the selected alternate shipping instruction is not other, then we can clear other out. Oops. And then, there you go, that's empty. So that's great. Everyone okay with this? Should we move on? Oh, you okay over there? You want me to go up? The one above? This one? Yeah. Um, all right, so if they have um, selected other and they don't have a value there, we shouldn't let them place the order because if they've chosen other, we're expecting some extra instruction. So what we can use is there's another data store we have called wc slash store slash validation. So if everyone wants to open this and take a look, um, I'll quickly explain it. It's a little confusing at first but what I will demonstrate is if you have an error in your form, so for example here it's telling me please enter a valid last name. Um, and if I try and proceed, if I try and place my order, it tells me that's not allowed. And the reason it knows this is because in the data store is an entry for the shipping last name. And that has the message and it says hidden false. The point of this hidden value is um, if you join the form, if you enter the form and you haven't filled in your address, we should, the, the field is technically invalid because there is no address there. However, if we just show errors immediately, it looks pretty bad. You're just gonna have a screen filled with red. So we, we have the errors, but they're hidden. So for user experience, it's, it's better. When you place the order, this, action runs, it says show all validation errors. That change is hidden to false and that is how they would appear. Um, it's actually up to the person displaying the error to honor that hidden value. You don't have to because you don't just get to display your errors for free. You have to explicitly add them. So that's what we're going to do in the next step if everyone is ready to move on. Uh, there is a task below. So the extra credit task, like I said, we're not gonna cover that during this workshop. 
you can ask me at the end, I can give you a hint. But the task below is write some code that will use set validation errors to add an entry to the validation data store uh, if the other shipping value is empty. So the API of that function, it takes one argument, and that's errors. And errors is an object. And as you saw here, it's just an object keyed by the field. So you see here, this, um, oh, I should mention actually, validation error ID, I have defined above, just to make it easier for everyone so you don't have to keep typing this field. So validation error ID is a constant, and you can use that. So validation error ID is the key. The message can be whatever you like, and hidden, uh, let's leave it hidden until we submit the form. So the hidden value should start off as false. Um, there's a light bulb because it's a React use effect. We want to do it when the other value changes. And if we add new things to the use effect, we should also reference them in the dependencies. So don't forget to do that. And uh, there's a little, little pointer finger. So if the value is not other, let's just not add the validation error. So I'll give everyone some time to do this. Uh, it might be a little confusing, the error, so if you need help, let me know. I'll come around and, uh, and give assistance if people need it. So, yeah, let's uh, try this task out and then we can go over it together afterwards.
Oh no, it went off, sorry. Um, so there's uh, some questions from people about this validation error. So if it displays in the data store, uh, that is not enough to get the error to show. So the validation data store is just where we store it. So because this is a custom block we're rendering, WooCommerce blocks can't actually do anything inside your block because this is just all your code. So what you have to do is you have to explicitly select that error from the data store and render it yourself it, wherever you like. Um, there's nothing in blocks that will pick it out and show it for you. So the next step is actually going to be to do that. So is everyone ready to move on? Seems good. Any Anyone struggling with the last step? No? Cool. So if we scroll up around, because I think everyone codes differently, people leave extra line breaks and stuff, around line 38, there should be a use select function like this. And use select is a hook uh, offered by WordPress data. And what that does is it lets you grab something from a data store. And they, they have things called selectors, which are predefined functions, which will pull specific items from a data store. So the one we're interested in is on the WC store validation data store. And we have a selector mentioned called get validation error. So if you would call the get validation error selector, on this store object, it will return you a specific validation error. And the parameter to that is the ID. So mine, because I, I didn't code it yet actually, but because my last name is invalid, this is the ID that's, this is the value that will be returned if I specifically ask for the shipping last name validation error. So I will, quickly add my uh, my set validation errors code. So if anyone struggled with the last step, you can follow along here. Um, and hopefully we can get it working. So set validation errors, this is a, called an action. So that's um, a way we get data into the data store using actions. And the API it takes an object and if you some people actually wrote it like this. They wrote validation error ID. Like so. And the, the problem with this is because it's, this is an object, this is, um, this is a literal property name. So what you need to do is put this in square brackets. And if that's in square brackets, what that will do is it will reference the variable I'm, I added above. So when it enters the data store, the key will be this. Because you can't have hyphens in property names unless you put them in square brackets. So that's what this is. Uh, that's what that's doing. And imagine we will say hidden should be true. And if we, oh yeah, we've got to update the dependencies too. So I will ask Esalen to do that. And the thing it added was set validation errors because that's a new function that we're using in the effect. So it's got to be referenced. If that function changes, we should rerun the effect. So if I reload, immediately, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it depends if that function is defined, if that function is what you expect it to be when the effect runs, yeah. However, if it comes from something like a, like an async function, it takes a while for the function to be returned. I don't know, maybe it depends on something asynchronous. That could be a use case for using it in the effect. In this case, it probably will work because I think it is synchronous, but for good practice, I would add it. Yeah, I think so for most cases. There are some cases where you shouldn't um, because if you, for example, update the data store with a new validation error, but for some reason you're referencing the validation error, when you update it, 
that use effect will kick off again and you'll get to an infinite loop. So there are some cases where you shouldn't, but for, for things like functions coming from data stores, you can add it. Uh, so what I wanted to show was we have our error here. And that's because the, the text box is empty. And the other code was if the, oh sorry, my bad. The next task to do was to update the code so that it will use clear validation error if we have changed away from other or if we've added a value. So I don't know, did everyone scroll down and get a chance to do this? Yeah, everyone did that, cool. So what we can do, so if the selected alternate shipping instruction is not other, we can clear validation error and we will clear the validation error ID. And if the other shipping value is not an empty string, or actually I saw a better idea, it was uh, not other shipping value dot length. Uh, yeah, I think that's good. We will clear the validation error, and then we should return early because we don't want to run set validation errors if this is true. So I reload the page. Because I haven't selected other, there's no error in the store. If I choose other, why well, we don't see it, that's too bad. I'm gonna debug, live debugging. Yeah, you're right, so. So yeah, we actually have an slint rule that will tell you if your dependencies aren't up to date and it will add the ones that are missing. So I hope now this works. Yeah, brilliant, thank you for that. And if we enter something, it gets cleared out. So the next step is gonna be to display this error. Uh, before I got sidetracked, I was talking about use select and there's another task in here, so we can use the get validation error function to pull that specific error out using the validation error ID, and that will, and we should return that from this function. And if you notice here, we assign that value to a variable. So the instructions mention the get validation error selector, and that's a function. So to that function, you pass the ID and you return that value from this use select function. So if everyone wants to give that a go, I hope the I hope the instructions for that one are clear. I think this can be tricky because it's something that not many people have worked with. So let me know if anyone gets stuck and I will help.
Okay, so I'm going to show you how to grab the error out of the store. So again, some people will have noticed like, okay, I've got the error, it still doesn't show. And that's going to be the next step we go on. Um, so also, I think we probably won't have time to finish the whole workshop. Uh, we have quite a few more bits to do, so we might we will have to cut this short. However, at the end, we are going to give you a link to the full solution. Um, you can go and take a look at that, uh, or you can just keep working through this. And anywhere there's a notepad, there's a task in there. Um, I also want to mention the spoilers folder. If people get stuck with something and they want to see the solution, there's a spoiler in there that will hopefully answer any questions you have about that specific task. Some of them don't have them, um, but a lot of them do, so feel free to look in there if you need help. So what we would do is, on the store object, we would use the get validation error selector, and to that you pass the validation error ID. And then we want to return this. And all that does is because you're, you're using get validation error, it will go to the data store, it will find, it will find the validation error based on the ID, and it will return the message and the hidden value. So we have this in our validation error object. Um, some people notice that clear validation error gets called a whole bunch. You can, now that we've done this step, you can use, you can check whether validation error is undefined. If it's undefined, that means it's not in the data store. So you don't have to do clear again. You can use that condition. It's, it's not a super big deal to do this multiple times, but if you can make it more efficient, then why not? Um, but I think that's an extra credit. Yeah, this is an extra credit, so we won't cover it, but you can you can try working on it uh, after it or now. Um, the next step, so we have the error. We don't want to display it. So at the very bottom of the file, there's another task, which is to write some code that will render the error. So above, remember, we got the error, and it's now stored in this validation error variable. We want to show the message field of our error. So you can just use a div to display that. You can use a paragraph. You know, you can use anything. Some libraries might have like a custom error component that you can pass a string to. That works as well. It's really up to you how you display this. And that comes back to what I mentioned earlier. Like blocks won't do this work for you. Um, so if everyone wants to give that a try, I will. This should be hopefully straightforward. We're just printing a property from an object, so we can uh, spend a few minutes on this. We'll go over it at the end. And there, there is actually a spoiler at the top, which contains the uh, the answer if people get stuck.
ja, ja. Did everyone get a chance to output the error? Has everyone tried? Did anyone? Sorry? You did? Nice. You didn't run into any sad ice cream cones? A sad, a sad ice cream cone? If, there, if you have an error in your block, it will not render, and instead you get a, an ice cream cone that fell over to show your error. Yeah. You didn't get that? That's good. OK, nice. Brilliant. So. Yeah, I'll quickly just uh, show this. Um, you can just render a div, for example, and then output validation error dot message. And that should work, right? We're just going to output the validation error's message. You made it harder. OK, OK, nice. So, oh, the sad ice cream cone. Too bad. So the problem is, so the reason that ice cream cone appears is because I just went straight to the message property. And because validation error initially is not set immediately, it's in a use effect, which is running as we render. So when it comes down here, it, it's not set. So it's like, well, I don't know what this message thing is. Trips up. So we can simply add a question mark here. And if, if it's undefined, it's not going to show anything. However, we could do it a little better, and if uh, validation if validation error is falsy, show null, or show our div, and uh, that should be fine. I say, please enter a value. So for extra credit, you can keep this hidden until they've interacted with the te te text box and then show it. Uh, it's kind of a little much to go into for now and not actually blocks related, so it's kind of more React thing. So you can, you can try and figure that out on your own. Um, again, as I mentioned, the hidden property here is a hint to you. So what you can do is you can do or validation error dot hidden. So if it's hidden, we will just render null. So if it's not hidden and there's a validation error, we can show the message. And Thomas, can you remove one of the other fields? Let's say the zip code or... Yeah. Take a look what happens then. So now you can see there's uh, some styling involved. So there's a red border, the text is red. Whereas if we go down and we select other, can you do that quickly? And you see, oh, the error message. Yeah, there. sorry, yeah, here it is. Okay. Yeah. But, but you saw <laughs> the error message before was black. So that might also be something you want to address to make sure to have the same styles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a class. Uh, I'm going to open the spoiler because there's a class here. If you add this class to your, if you add this class to your div, It will be red, so feel free to use that class to make it red. May I ask you something? Yeah. The JS doesn't appear on the slide in the React spec. Does it get in the file behind the scenes on it? Yeah, so uh, when you came in, one of the commands was npm run start, and that will, that this uses Webpack. It's in, yeah, it's included in the template that you installed. So you might have your own build tool. This was just for the workshop, you know. Yeah, it's Webpack. Um, yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of it for the front end. If we enter text here, that goes away. That's it for the front end. We have like I think ten minutes left on the talk. There's a whole bunch of back end stuff we need to look at. <laughs> the, actually, it's not so complex. The back end stuff. There's two big files to look at. Um, we've done the hard work. The next steps are to look at the integration interface that we wrote. I'm trying to zoom in there. And um, 
I was going to kind of explain how to do these tasks, explain how the, this integration interface flows. I can, I can go over it quickly. I, like I say, I don't think we're going to have time to code it, but essentially what happens is when you register this integration interface, you will need to, when the checkout block is registered, you need to grab our integration registry, which is passed to the callback of the checkout block registration hook. So when we register the checkout block, this hook gets fired. You can register your integration interface there. So basically what happens is all the integration interfaces, so like any plugin that has something to do with blocks will use an integration interface. They get put into a list, and when it comes to render time, it will, blocks will call the initialize function for each integration interface. So any code you want to write that will happen when the checkout block is rendering uh, on the server side should go in the initialize function of your integration interface. And here, yeah, we've just registered our scripts, so front end script, editor script, and editor styles. Uh, the main integration is where we register like the block JS stuff, so all the uh, all the code we've just been working on, and the one underneath that is the extend store API function. And this is an, a separate file. I mentioned we keep it separate because this is kind of like the interface between blocks and the back end, but the extending the store endpoint is a, it should be a separate class. You should do it as a class and well, you don't have to do it as a class. I like to do it as a class because you can statically reference the init function. It means you don't have to instantiate it and keep a instance around. Um, so here, we have the store API container. And this is, when WooCommerce Blocks is set up, the store API container is set up as well. And it has some classes on there. Specifically, the one that's interesting for adding API calls, uh, adding fields to the API is extend schema. Um, if people have worked with blocks before, you might know it as extend rest API, but officially it's now extend schema. Um, so what that does, there's a task in extend store, which tells you to Basically, it tells you how to extend the API. And what we need to add to the API is two fields. We need to add the, the value of the select box and the value of the text box. There's two fields there. However, one should be optional because if you don't have the other text, the API shouldn't expect that to be filled in. So that is down a little bit in here. It's all commented out because it would break otherwise. Uh, you can follow the instructions to uncomment this code and add a description, define the type. So this is basically the WordPress API, uh, WordPress REST API that, that we're extending here, ultimately under the hood. Um, so that's basically, these are our two, our two fields that we're adding. So that means when we submit the checkout form, the checkout route expects these values to be in the request. Given the lack of time, should we do it directly? Yeah. Just show it? Yeah, we can do that, yeah. That's okay. So the task is to find the extend checkout scheme method, make some changes. So that's this one down here. So we can uncomment this code and then we can follow these steps. So the description is just kind of, it doesn't actually get used by anything during normal operation, but it's just a, a good practice to like describe what your API fields do. So if you come to like write documentation for them, for example, it will be described. So we can say, and then we can set the type to be a string because that's what the user will enter. 
the context is where this API field will be expected. So we can put view and edit in there. Uh, read only is whether the value can change later on in the request if something can come and update this. We don't want it to. It should be optional because it's not always present. And this arg options, the validate callback function, is a way for you to check the data submitted is what you will expect it to be. So it's super simple. We can just go value. And if, if it's a string, this passes. If it's not a string, like someone submits something else that's not what we're expecting, the API will error, the order won't submit. And again, down here is the same thing again, but it's a separate field. So we have to go through the description. We have to define the type. And then same function. And we can come up here and uncomment this. And what that will do now is when the checkout schema is registered, so the checkout schema is the description of all of these fields. So our checkout schema is what's the shipping address, what's the billing address, what's the email, and what are the items in the cart. We've now added our two extra fields. So when we submit, of form and actually the cool thing about this is if you're doing back-end only code you don't actually need to reload the page because each API request is separate you just get to press place order and it worked because it got the data it was expecting if I didn't send if we did something wrong earlier in the workshop and we didn't have the extension data in the data store it would have failed it would have said we expect the um, alternate shipping instruction to be a string, and it wasn't, so. And now that you added it to the store API, you, you created that, that um, you extended the store API, yep. the value is now in the database, right? Not yet. We need to add the value to the database. So again, the API just has the value. We now need to hook into some things in order to save this, so. Down here, we have save shipping instructions, which has some tasks. And again, due to lack of time, I'm, I will run through it. Um, if you want to try it after the workshop, it's great. We're also going to leave you some like contact information. So if anyone after the workshop wants to get in touch, there, there will be some information on the slides. Um, so yeah, we have this hook, WooCommerce store API, check out update order from request and this fires whenever you press place order submits to the back end and then this hook runs with the request passed as an argument we also have the order as an argument so if i hope everyone is familiar with the way the checkout orders are made in the block we save a draft order when you enter the block and then when you submit and it's successful that draft gets turned into a, a published uh, a completed order basically um, so yeah, every time the place order button is pressed, this hook happens. So again, the tasks from the shipping workshop request data array. So here I defined the shipping workshop request data. This is the request value that gets passed to the API. And in that is a key called extensions. And every other extension that adds stuff will actually have an entry in here. So if you have like, for example, WooCommerce subscriptions, this extensions key will contain WooCommerce subscriptions data too, because their integration will need it. So the request has everything. And then we use this get name to access our namespace. So from that, we can get the alternate shipping instruction and the other shipping value and then we will add them in their own variables so we can use them later. And 
then we can update the metadata on the order. Again, this is not super block specific. This is kind of regular old WooCommerce. But we can use the order that gets passed to this hook. That is the draft order I mentioned earlier. We can, sorry, update metadata. And we can set this key. You can you could choose whatever key you like. This is just the one I chose. And then we will set that to this value. And then we'll do the same for the other text. And the extra credit is to don't set the other text if it's not submitted. But we can we can do that afterwards. And then Finally, the last thing to do is save the order. And now that, if we add something to our cart again, and check out, that will actually be saved in the order. Is that the right one? Yeah. So it's actually saved down here in the custom fields. Um, there is some tasks to show it in the order. There's some tasks to show it in the order confirmation, which is this page. At the moment, it's not shown, so we can we can show it there. And finally, the one the final one is to include it in the confirmation email. So I don't think we have time to cover them right now. I think we should probably wrap up. But yeah, I hope this was uh, useful to everyone. Um, yeah, goodbye. I think the, 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 the order confirmation page and the email, definitely no time. But what we can potentially do is the WP admin, where you just showed the order. If you can go back to the... This, this yeah. function? Uh, yeah, 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 exactly that one. Okay. Because that's like... Super all right, all right, fine. We'll do this real quick. <laughs> so this hook I added is just underneath. Maybe if you go back to the to the WP admin to the back end. Mm -hmm. Do not have a pointer, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm big enough. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> here you see the shipping instructions here, and they're currently empty. And it would be nice if we actually have the fields not only downstairs where we where you showed them before, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but if they would be in that section here. So I give you a minute. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, no pressure. <laughs> so this is the hook, and that this hook happens underneath the shipping address. So I already added the title, and the next thing to do will be to print out the Shipping workshop alternate instruction. And also, if they added other instructions. We can also output that. So there we go. We have the shipping instruction and the custom value. So there's uh, another mini task as well because actually what is saved here is the value of the input field, not the nice text. So as an extra task, if you want to somehow map the values back to the nice nice displays. Here might be a good way to decide that. You can just add a switch statement, for example. But that's pretty much the long and short of it. So we have some time for uh, questions and answers. Let me just go through. Yeah, we have a Q&A session. But first, I want to say thank you to everyone for attending. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And I will leave our contact information 
on the screen while we answer any questions that anyone has. So feel free to take this down. Um, there is also a there's also a package that I wrote um, in WooCommerce called Extend Cart Checkout Block, and that contains more examples of extensibility. So if you visit the WooCommerce GitHub repo, look in Packages, look in JS, look in Extend Cart Checkout Block, you'll find it. But uh, in the final version of this uh, workshop, I'll add a link to it in the, the readme, so you'll get it. So is there any questions anyone has? I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, we showed you that you start with the starter package. Now the question is, where can we reach the final package? Yeah, so the final package is available on GitHub. If you go to GitHub, you go to my username, which is OPR. The final workshop is called WCEU 23 Shipping Workshop Final. So. That's it, but if there, if maybe people want to take a note of this because I didn't put it in the slides, but if you want to take a photo of this, feel free to grab that now. This has the completed stuff. Some of it doesn't have the extra credit stuff, but again, feel free to jump into Slack, ask a question. We have a question at the back, I think. Um, it's a suggestion. A suggestion, okay. Can we put that link in the blocks and blocks in the channel? Yeah, I'll add that. Yeah. yeah I I don't have Slack open right now. I'll do it. I'll do it after the session. Yeah, no worries. Good suggestion. Thanks. Yeah. So that's the final workshop. I, yeah. I will add this to Slack. Um, let me go back here. Yeah. I will add this to our Slack channel. Uh, can you remind me of the uh, channel name, Pi? Can you remind me of the channel name? Let me let me open that. Where is it? Yeah. Oh, I don't have it open. Oh, sorry. Well, yeah. Let me open this again. Right, you can take this down. So, any other questions? Anyone? No, I think we're good. Um, I have a question to you. Who of you gonna start extending WooCommerce blocks now? <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not so much. Okay. If you have any questions, please ask, reach out, um, any comments, any suggestions. Um, we're always super happy for feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, both hang around in this Slack a lot, and then we're always active on GitHub as well. So we should answer pretty, pretty quickly. So thank you, everyone, for coming.